there's a clear uh, position. <laughs> uh, tabloid games probably represent the most common form of, of news game that exists, for better or worse. And these are the kinds of things that uh, random people just uh, just create, usually very quickly in response to, to issues. There was uh, the, um, the So You Think You Can Drive Mel game, which was a game about um, Mel Gibson's uh, unfortunate uh, anti Semitic drunk driving episode. There's this kind of one button shaky game uh, where you shoot, shoot a fellow hunter. Uh, the the uh, the Zidane the hothead Zidane post uh, uh, World Cup headbutting game, <laughs> and then this game about uh, 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 the uh, Octo Mom, right? <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of examples of, of yellow yellow uh, these games. Uh, far uh, far less common are these these, these reportage games, which will seek to present. Uh, current events without a bias, or at least without as heavy a bias. This is actually one of my games that we did for the New York Times, uh, which was about uh, uh, FDA inspection. This is several years old now, but the game tried to explain uh, and depict the relative difficulty of maintaining safety protocols uh, given the increase in imports uh, over uh, the course of a decade while, while funding and staffing levels remain the same. Or another one of my games that the Times published about the uh, the merit-based evaluation system, better known as the, uh, the points-based green card uh, system, which was debated in the McCain Kennedy uh, Migration Act uh, several years ago. And this, is, this just literally takes the legislation and operationalizes it so you can see how, how it would work. Okay, okay. Uh, infographics. Infographics have a, a long tradition, obviously, in news making. And one way to think about news games is, is that they, they make inter infographics playable. And, and the results of that merit may not exactly be games in the way that we normally think of them, but they have kind of game-like features. And these, these playable infographics, as we sometimes call them, they might add goals or direction to large data systems, uh, which uh, do the work of synthesizing material that may not otherwise be presented in that fashion in, in, uh, uh, in infographic form. So, you know, there are some examples of these that are kind of neither journalism nor games, but that, that serve as inspiration. This is, this is the baby name Voyager, which you, you may have seen. It's actually quite popular in information design circles. What you can do is you can type in a name, and you can see uh, its relative popularity over the course of the 20th century, um, you know, variants of it, and, you know, here we see the, the progression of Kate into Caitlin. And uh, one of the things that people seem to do with this, uh, this tool, it's really a tool, it's meant to help you choose a name for your baby, is they kind of, they kind of play with it. You know, oh, let me see if I can find a name that was like popular in the 1920s and then you'll fill out a favor. Or uh, you, know, you, you can kind of set your own goals, and, and that, that's so you know a way of of experimenting uh, with data that we can take advantage of in a more deliberate way. Um, or you know, a game that uses maps. This is uh, a game that you probably already know since it was developed here at USC, the redistricting game, which is a, you know fundamentally about understanding something about gerrymandering by manipulating maps. So here, the, the map is the, the form that's borrowed from infographics. Uh, this is a very simple game. It may not even be appropriate to call it a game, really. A virtual butterfly ballot from this, the uh, South Florida Sun Sentinel, which was meant to demonstrate uh, the, the rationale behind voter misunderstanding in the, in the, uh, in the 2000 election. So the, the idea of, of kind of recreating the ballot as a sort of diagram and letting you choose what you think you're choosing and then see whether your choice was actually what you thought. Uh, now, this is not a game. This is just one of these... Um, these uh, kind of interactive infographics that have become very popular. And I see the playable infographic trend as, as kind of a salve to the, the obsession with, with this sort of chart porn uh, that we see these days. This is a um, how do people spend their day infographic that, that the New York Times published. And it was just crazy popular, and people were tweeting about it and blogging about it. And you know, it's, it's really attractive and appealing, and you can see why it was so popular. It's about you know, how different demographics spend their time during the day. Everyone has an entry point into it, you can explore it, it, it you know, does these kind of animations. But it doesn't necessarily tell us anything. Uh, it's, it's not synthetic, it's just pure information. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an unfortunate uh, misstep, really, in presenting information as in journalistic fashion. If you compare this to games or kind of playable infographics that are on their way to games, um, that offer more direction, so we can see how they, they seem to need a function more synthetically. This is a, another New York Times infographic. Uh, is it better to buy or rent? So here you, you have a goal, and you're like directed toward that goal from the get-go. Like, 
you ask yourself, what parameters do I need such that I could buy a house in a particular location? Or what would it be like uh, for someone I know in a particular location um, to, uh, to be able to afford a house? Uh, and then a, you know, a more deliberate example of a game based on data is Budget Hero, which American Public Media made. This is a federal budget game. There seem to be all sorts of budget games. It's a very popular genre. And they've taken the bar chart, sort of um, uh, created this, this analogical depiction of, uh, uh, of the, the state of the nation financially. Uh, what's interesting about this game is that the, the player sets their goals beforehand. They, they decide which, uh, which areas are of value to them and create these sort of badges that they're then working for. And the way that the game uh, develops a uh, kind of goal-based experience is by measuring whether the player succeeded in, in meeting those values, those goals, while also seeing how far they're able to take the budget into the future without breaking the bank. Uh, documentary, uh, documentary games. Uh, so video games can also adapt and, 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 and alter the traditions of, of, of documentary and, and investigative reporting. These are often games that are more long form. They may look more like traditional games than some of the other categories. And we suggest three approaches to documenting actuality in, in games, you know, spatial, operational, uh, and, and procedural. I'll give you just one example of, of each of those. This is a, a, a mod uh, of Half-Life 2 um, uh, called Berlin Wall. And all it is is a, it's just an experience of a space. Uh, you see a, a mo it's very hard to see, I apologize. But the, um, the, it recreates the space around the Berlin Wall, but doesn't doesn't create any of the actuality uh, of its operation. You can kind of run around at will, and you don't alert any sus suspicion. You can cross check quite thoroughly without any consequence. But you see the, the kind of layout of the environment in a, in a three dimensional way. So that's that's what a, a sort of spatial reality game might look like. Uh, whereas an operational reality game strives to recreate the events themselves in some way. Uh, and this is a a mission from 2004 in an episodic news-based war game called Kuma War, which tried to recreate the infamous Vietnam Swift Boat campaign by John Kerry, who was then running for president. Uh, there, are, there, there are many problems with this game, but it's an example of, uh, of attempting to just recreate an event in the play that And then in, in, in a procedural reality game, uh, what the game is trying to reproduce is not necessarily what took place, but the interactions with the rules of the underlie those events, the systems that created them in the first place. This is a, a very controversial uh, game that you can no longer get called JFK Reloaded, in which you try to recreate the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And there's a fairly sophisticated physics and ballistics simulation of the game. The way that the game presented itself was a way of interrogating the, the feasibility of the Warren Commission report, kind of acting as a mass forensic examination. And you know, some, some games that we might lump into this category are more like home video than they are like feature documentary. Um, you can call, call them human interest games, maybe. This is a game called Gravitation by a game artist named Jason Rohr, which is about his struggle to balance family life with artistic inspiration. Uh, puzzles. The news, it turns out, has a century long history of providing puzzles uh, to citizens, particularly the crossword we think of as the main example. And puzzles, quizzes, and related forms, they don't carry news content necessarily, but they, they kind of lead readers to that content, or they provide them with an incentive to, to procure the paper um, in the first place. And, and one of the primary things that, that puzzles seem to do is give us a sense of mastery or ritual in a world that we don't have control of. Uh, one of the interesting things about this, this market, and it really is a market, is gigantic, and there's an argument we make in the book that suggests that the three or four billion dollar casual game industry was the news industries to have, but uh, it didn't realize that it was in the business of making puzzle games. So, you know, some of these games are kind of borrowing from the traditions of the crossword directly. This is a game called Scoop, and you download this game and it uses um, RSS news feeds to generate these, these sort of very simple crossword puzzles in which you're filling in the words from headlines. Uh, and there's no, there's no um, kind of crossword style skill or knowledge involved. You, you just, you just kind of cut the letters, and it, it gives that kind of it's like doodling, or you play a game like Bejeweled, and you're not really looking for intellectual experience. You're just kind of looking for something to do. That's what, that's what this game does. Um, Crickler, which is a, a syndicated crossword style, uh, a word game, is a little more connected to news content, drawing its clues from news stories, and, and you have to have a little bit larger synthetic understanding of 
what, what happened in the news recently in order to, uh, uh, to, to complete these puzzles. Uh, structurally, what's interesting about this game is that it really is just the crossword puzzle with headlines as clues, but because they explode the crossword puzzle into these, these sort of line-based uh, responses, uh, these can be computer generated uh, very quickly, whereas a crossword has to be hand authored. And there are more and more examples of news organizations that are sort of seeing this, this puzzle experience as something that, that they can offer, that they have some stake in. This is the Telegraph in the UK, which, which actually offers a whole uh, like section of their website where you can pay a subscription and get access to a number of different puzzles, some of which are uh, derived from existing forms like the crossword and some of which are, are new. What's unfortunate about this really is that it's still completely separated from the rest of the news. And what the crossword really did over its long history was uh, provide an excuse to look at the newspaper. And when we use the newspaper as our primary experience of the news, uh, you may have even bought, and these evidence that suggests that you may have even just bought the paper for, for the puzzle. And then, like you have the paper anyway, and you did the puzzle in the morning, you kind of had your ritual activity. You have to pass by the rest of this news content to get there. <laughs> So games can also be used to, uh, to teach players um, about the practice of, of journalism itself. They can be used instructionally uh, in the field of journalism. Some games are created um, explicitly for, uh, for you know, journalism school or for, um, for children to give kids the sense that being a journalist is a, is a career path that they might, uh, they might choose in the future. And others are kind of used as advocacy. Um, they, they, say that they help citizens better understand the role of journalism in society and their relationship uh, to it. And many of the latter kind of games are really just commercial games that, that you wouldn't think of, of, of as news games at all if you saw them on the shelf at Walmart. This is a game called Beyond Good and Evil, which is a sort of sci-fi fantasy game. And you would normally think of it just as entertainment, but it, it, it's also kind of a public literacy tool. The story in the game is one of uh, kind of an allegory of the role of the free press in political life inside of this, this fictional planet. And the, the player is uh, has this, this very visceral first-person experience of the behavior of a government um, that is telling a story different from uh, what is actually it's telling a story in public. It's different from the acts that it's, it's actually perpetrating in private. Um, or, or this is Dead Rising, um, which is a zombie game, a zombie killing game. Which maybe again, maybe not the, the most obvious candidate for, for journalistic content. But you, you play the role of a, everything is zombies now. Of course, so that's, uh, that's everything. Maybe. Um, there's you're a you're a photojournalist. You take the role of a photojournalist in the game, and you also kill zombies uh, on your way to uh, different missions. There's kind of this case-based structure, and time passes continuously, regardless of of what the player does, and so you have to like really plan your actions, and it all takes place within the shopping mall that's been invested. You're trying to save, um, uh, you know, normal uh, uh, living humans who are, are, are stuck in this mall. Uh, and, and the process of like planning, planning your, your time, and you know, maximizing safety, and also trying to pursue information, it's, it's not, it's not an accurate recreation of the experience of, of a journalist, but it's, it's something approaching that. And, and when it's presented to the general public as an experience that they can take part in. Um, outside of an educational context, then they get some, at least some initial sense of what it would be like uh, uh, to live that life uh, professionally. And, and then there are lots of games, I'm not going to talk about, about all of them, lots of games that try to train you to be a journalist or depict the, the experience of this one. This is a, a, glo a global conflict series of which there are, uh, there are two uh, versions. One takes place in Palestine. And you, you take the role of a journalist interviewing subjects and creating a story. It's very narrative driven. You have to, you have to construct your story and, and you know, create your evidence and then you submit it to your editor and so forth. And some of these games have been made for, for uh, kind of purpose built uh, uh, applications either online or in, um, in installation. There's some of the museum, for example, that are more, uh, more directed to kids. Uh, community games. This is sort of maybe the, the least familiar genre to most people. So in the broader gaming community, there are some new genres of games that, instead of being played entirely on screens uh, or at computers, are played out in the world but are kind of facilitated by computer technologies. Some people call them big games, uh, and maybe the best known genre within this area is the alternate reality game, or the ARG, the ARG. Um, and because these games have to be played in specific locations, they offer an opportunity to get players out into the world, either through incentives and game structures that encourage 
that kind of participation or by introducing them to aspects of communities they might not uh, otherwise have pursued. It's a genre that has like a weird history. It started really as a kind of promotional genre. This is a game, or it's a, sh a, so a shot of people playing a game called I Love Bees, which was a very large scale, well-funded promotional game uh, for the release of, uh, of Halo 2, which is a, just an ordinary video game, you know, uh, kind of fantasy shooter. But in the game, there was, this, there was this science fictional story. In order to partake of it, you had to uh, do this kind of geocaching-like uh, uh, kind of uh, investigative experience where you would find pay phones that corresponded with GPS locations, and those pay phones would ring at particular times, which also had to be decoded from information presented to the players. And if you were there at the right time, then you could get like this little bit uh, of the story. Um, and, and you, you know, this was not meant to be journalistic at all, but one of the things that it did was to, to kind of force people to think about the payphone as a concept, you know, which doesn't really exist anymore, and, and, and to go physically into their communities to find these, these, these locations, these kind of forgotten corners of public space. And, and that's something that's been explored even further in later, later, uh, later examples of the genre. This is, this is a game called Last Call Poker, in which you play poker in any, any cemetery, by assembling uh, a hand, uh, uh, a kind of uh, a Texas Hold'em hand, partly from card values that are decoded from tombstones. So like the, the, the digits in the, in the year of death and the shape of the tombstone correspond with the, the, the number and the, uh, and the, the suit of the card. Uh, and there are other rules. You have to be touching another partner and you have to be able to, to reach uh, two tomb the two tombstones with the complete your hand at the same time and all of that. And the game's purpose was to call attention to uh, these spaces that are kind of considered taboo, um, that we don't visit, and that are being relocated, and to reinvigorate the, the, the graveyard as a sort of social space, to remind us that it once was a uh, social space, um, and also to, uh, to lead potentially to kind of civic action surrounding things like the relocation of, uh, uh, of cemeteries in favor of you know, your favorite mixed-use development, which is anthropology or something. This may be the best known of these, of these ARGs, a game called World Without Oil, in which uh, players pretended that there was this, this giant oil crisis and they didn't have access to gasoline, and they kind of carried out their lives uh, as, the, as they think that they would have if they were really living under a crisis like this. Um, so it wasn't necessarily attempting to provide uh, viable solutions, but to give people a sense of what it would feel like to live in a world uh, in which you know, gasoline costs six or seven dollars a gallon, and, in which they couldn't get access to food because it wasn't being transported because you know there was uh, there was not access to refineries and things like that, uh, and and you know it's it's a bit anecdotal but many of the players who took part in these games uh, reportedly took on new practices in their lives that they kept afterwards. I mean they started community gardens or you know they chose to bike to work once a week. <clears throat> There's at least one example of a news organization trying one of these games. Um, the uh, Rochester Democrat Chronicle made this game called Picture the Impossible with, uh, with RIT. And uh, it was a, a, a modest uh, experiment that took place last year in which uh, citizens were encouraged to uh, take on these missions that, that forced them to go partake of activities in the, the local cultural scene. And then they would come back and they would include these different teams and they would kind of repeat them. The last category we talk about in the book, Platforms, um, this may be the highest concept uh, of the areas that we explore. But the idea is that journalists uh, can also invent new genres or new infrastructures for building new forms of news games. And uh, you know, the fantasy sports are, are a wonderful example of, of this, a wonderful, successful example of something like this. Uh, fantasy sports emerged um, and evolved over many decades, but they really emerged from the exhaust of, of sports news. It's like, well, if we have all this information about sports results, what can we do with it? And one of the things you can do is you can recombine it in surprising ways and kind of pick, you know, pick your players and pick your teams uh, and compete with your friends. And this is like a billion dollar industry. So this is not necessarily the only example, but it's one example of what it looks like when a uh, kind of news content or infrastructure is, uh, is harvested. Uh, for other purposes. Uh, there have been other attempts. Uh, this is one uh, called Play the News, which has which since closed, uh, since it opened a few years ago. Uh, but it was an attempt to create a platform for news, a uh, kind of news-based prediction market, in, in which you would, um, you would take a story that was ongoing, and they had to build all this content through their own little editorial group. Um, so you would, you would, you would find a, um, 
problem, which would then be presented to players, and you know you would dig into the implications, and then what you were supposed to do were make these predictions about what's going to happen next. Uh, and if you could, this is still online, you can find it. You see all the discussion that uh, the players were having about you know, how to rationalize the choices that they were making, and then you know once something actually happens and, and, and the event you know carries on a little bit further, then the game gets updated and you sort of um, uh, you know you achieve success based on how accurate your predictions were. That's another example of the kind of thing that I mean when I talk about platform. Uh, and then there, there are other even weirder examples. This is a game uh, called Democracy 2, which is made by this, this one guy in the UK. And it's a, uh, uh, it's a sort of social simulation in which you're, I mean, it, it, it purportedly, it, it purports to put you in charge of a government, but really you're, you're more like a, a god because you can make arbitrary decisions. Uh, but the, the idea is that you have this society and you can, you can change it. Uh, and all of those changes are exposed in this, this relatively uh, complex but, but, but accessible spreadsheet-based data format. Uh, and so you can crack open all this stuff and, and also add new things to it. So as different events uh, take place, the, um, the data and the, uh, the access to different kinds of ideas uh, get updated in the game. And it's not uncommon I get these emails from them, you know, with updates to the game. And what, you know, there's like a whole host of recent events that have sort of been interpreted and represented in, inside of uh, inside of the game for further exploration. Uh, so you know, it's, it's it's maybe a bit outlandish to say this, but you could imagine that uh, the news the news industry could be in in the business of providing like software middleware for uh, for games of any kind, not just entertainment games, but a, a whole new genre of um, of uh, uh, documentary or investigative reporting games in which it's important to have accurate economic models or political models of how. Uh, how systems and governments operate. So in the same way that we have like physics engines that we plug into to games today, maybe we would have political engines or something in the future. You know, the way that we close the book, and I, I'm, we can talk about this more if you want to. I have some experience trying to make and publish these games with news organizations like the New York Times and CNN and, and others. Um, but you know, the analogy I often use is that if you were inventing televised uh, evening news or cable news today, and your attitude toward the success of that genre of newsmaking was to try one broadcast. We'll make one broadcast, and we'll, we'll put it out there, and then we'll see if people watch it. And if they don't, then we're going to can the whole thing, because obviously it's going nowhere. You wouldn't really be learning anything about the potential of television news, because the whole idea of the news is, is the repetition and the infrastructure in which it's, it's, uh, uh, it's being broadcast, and the relationship that people have with their televisions, all that kind of stuff. And so like, all of this has to be built kind of from the ground up if this, this whole idea of a news game is going to be successful. And not only does it have to be built, but it, it probably has to be built differently for different genres and approaches. So th there's a tremendous opportunity here, uh, but none of it happens unless we hunker down and start, and start making stuff for real with uh, medium to long-term investment. And that's really what hasn't happened yet. And hopefully, hopefully we'll see more of that. Uh, so I, I want to leave plenty of time for, for discussion. I think we're, we're right on track for that. This is this is my email. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm really really eager to hear from you. I'm continuing work on this. We have another grant from Knight to build this. I would call it an authoring system rather than a generation system for um, for small scale current event games. Um, and I see these categories for me have become like a little idea book, a sort of opportunity space for new projects. Uh, but by no means do I think it's complete. Thanks for coming. So, questions? Comments? A question. Um, so, I'm curious what the reception has been for you from journalists right. on what you're doing. And, and I guess, as a part two, how often are you actually working with with reporters, journalists to, to actually make these games. Right. The the reception is is as follows: um, excitement and eagerness, uh, followed by nothing. <laughs> <laughs> when I started publishing games in the New York Times, everybody called it because it was the New York Times, and they all wanted to make games. Uh, and I talked to all of them and showed them what we were doing. And, and like my deal at the Times was was was. It was through, uh, you know, my my company. It's a small company. We took all the risks. They paid us like columnists. Uh, it was a loss leader kind of thing. We lost money on it. We were just trying to to prove the model. 
Um, and they stopped publishing, uh, they literally stopped publishing our games. They just kind of put them, put them under the, you know, under the stack of other stuff on the desk after a while. We had, we had um, this great game about uh, steroids and baseball um, that was finished and, and has never been published. Uh, and they paid out our contract uh, and we can make games. So, you know, then I talked to everybody else and, you know, they, they all wanted to have done it, right? And to try it out, but, but not to actually go through the process of doing it, which you know, included the, the problems of editorial and what, what kind of content we would want to create, what, what, how would you publish these even, um, what's the business model around these? Uh, and I had, I had answers, at least tentative ones, for all those, all of those questions. This was, this, this was many years ago now. This was starting in 2005, 2006, which in, you know, in technology years is a long time ago. And we were, we were really making those kind of small scale uh, current event games rather than some of these larger things. But if you look at that as an, as an easy way to take on a little bit of risk, even those were, were tough. Uh, to carry out for news organizations. So I, I think, you know, my summary, which is in the book too, is that the obstacles are all organizational politics and, uh, you know, inertia and that sort of thing. Uh, but I've always been working with, with, with journalists on this work. Um, I haven't made any of these games that, uh, that haven't been touched in some way by, by traditional journalists. All of, I mean, that, the problem with technology in general is that this is now like a Pandora's box. The problem with internet technology and technology in general is that the, the Silicon Valley high-tech attitude um, is, has no politics. It's all about just technology is the future. Um, and so I'm completely on board with putting this stuff in the hands of people who have chosen to devote you know, their, their careers and their lives to helping people make choices and live better. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that it's still been very hard to get a kind of shift in, not just in production, but even in kind of risk management around, uh, around this work. And um, one of the ideas behind building this, this authoring system that we've got some money from Knight to do is to at least make the process a bit easier so we can get it out to a larger number of people. And, and folks like me who make games don't have to be involved as much. Uh, we'll see if that, if that helps. Without revealing anything uh, proprietary. I'm happy to reveal anything <laughs> uh, Okay. Uh, I, I'm interested if you can expand a little bit more on the, that experience with the New York Times. Okay, yeah. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, you know, they were getting it cheap. Yeah. If they're paying it. $1,500. Right. If they're paying the okay. column prices, they're getting it for, for nothing. Yeah. From their perspective. Yeah. From their perspective. Right. And they did use a few. And and yeah, published the, those two that I showed. And they've got professionals who are building it, so it's no drain on their resources. Yes, no resource drain. It's 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 a freebie for them. You you think that would you? Yeah. So what is your <laughs> that's, that's that's what I want to hear. I mean, what is your what what was your read of that situation? I mean, in yeah. two thousand six, the the New York Times was not stumbling around in the in the you know uh, medieval darkness. So one of the problems was that the paywall was still up back then. Uh, and yeah. editorial content had to go behind the paywall according okay. to them. Right. And that certainly didn't help. We had done some previous games that were published on shockwave.com, which is just a yeah. games portal. Uh, like I did this game about airport security. It was super popular in 2006. And <laughs> a game about the food safety, safety, a game about um, the, the kind of relationship between geopolitics and, and, and the oil market, and a game about holiday shopping. Um, and those games were just commercially published. They ran pre-roll video ads, which were at that time selling at like, you know, $35 CPMs and things. Um, we made them in two weeks. They had, there was a little bit of, I mean, there was, there was, they were put together. They had a business model. I couldn't make them. Um, and those games did uh, well. I mean, at least the best games did well. Like, at this point, tens of millions of plays. Uh, but the hit rate is I think about like 20 percent. The hit the hit rate in terms of the ones that really resonate with people that they that they come back through that they that they share that become kind of hits. And that seems like a pretty <coughs> decent hit rate right out of the gate. Not having really done any of these before, we were getting like a 20 percent success rate. So I needed that amount of runway with the Times, and it was different with the Times, and I never got it. I never even got the chance. Uh, I, don't, I don't I don't even think they knew how well they were doing. Like we asked them, are people playing? What are they doing? Where are they going? Where are they? Where are they coming from? Um, and somebody knew, probably, in the organization, uh, just, not, just not our editor. Um, so, you know, the, the, the read that I have is that no one was going to levy any blame for not publishing the video. Like, that was just not going to happen. 
Like, why didn't you publish a video game this week? But never a question is going to be asked. And so it just went to the bottom of the stack. And it wasn't really their fault, even. It's just like the structure of the organization put certain things, uh, gave certain things higher priority than others. And we were at the bottom of the stack. You know, the, the lesson I've learned, not just with, with the news organization, but any kind of organization dealing with video games, is that unless there's some strong motivator that's coming from a high-level individual who's saying, we're, we're investing in new stuff, I'm going to judge you based on not your success, but your how much experimentation you do and how much knowledge you gain from that. It's very hard. Like in advertising, it's the same. In, in corporate learning, which is an area I've worked in, it's the same. I uh, haven't worked with Times for several years. Maybe things are different. They're doing a lot of work with this database journalism stuff. Um, and then, you know, that's just one genre of game. Maybe it's not the one for them. Maybe what they ought, ought to have been doing was sort of lot fewer larger scale games that dealt with uh, complicated issues and presented them in, uh, in a way that matched their, um, their perception of their value and their contribution. Uh, so that's, you know, that's one of the things that led me eventually um, to trying to think about news games as not a, a, a specific genre, but a broad category in which there were many possible implementations, those, those small games being one. Yes? Um, what kind of programming background do you need to have to even design a simple news game? It's not just pro I mean, you need to be able to make stuff with computers, but you also need to have this, this kind of game design. Okay. Making games is, is almost impossible. Um, making good games is really, really almost impossible. Um, making a good game in a day or a week um, that, that looks good and plays well, um, let alone you know making a, a sophisticated, complex game that deals uh, meaningfully with a difficult issue. This is hard for anybody. Uh, and it's, it's possibly harder to make a game like this than to make a zombie killing game because you kind of know what to do, right? You put a bunch of zombies in it, and you know, then you're just too many. Um, so that, that's a challenge. You, you, I, I, I think the um, there is there is a, an emerging future in which we have computational journalists, um, you know, people who have a computational expertise but are really deeply invested in and have a background in the the values and purposes of journalism. And those days are just beginning right now. And uh, you know, I'm trying at, at Georgia Tech to think about how we might how we might invest in that area, and I'm not really sure what, what the path forward is, to be honest, but that would be the, the ideal candidate. You know, someone who, just like just like a, a, a reporter can write, but then can kind of like try to make sense of issues, and then they just happen to like, you know, spill it all out on paper. That's what you want to be able to do with computers. And we're, we're kind of a long way from there, on, on a large scale. Uh, but there's no shortcutting this. You know, making, making software is hard, and you have to be able to do it. Uh, this, this authoring system that we're building is, is another approach to a particular kind of game. And I don't know, I mean, it's a very high risk project, and we'll see if it succeeds. But it's only, it's only even trying to make a very particular kind of current event game that, that is kind of the size and shape of, of like an editorial cartoon, and is meant only to kind of prime a reader to kind of get them in, and give them a little welcome at in which they, they look at a local issue and say, oh, you know, uh, that's going on. Now maybe I want to go and find out more. So that's the kind of surgical approach that we've taken with, with authoring systems. Uh, people like to think that, that you just like just like throw together some thing. I drag some stuff around, and, uh, and then I get a game on the other end. But games aren't like, um, they're, not, they, they, they're not like lens-based media, where you, you take a camera, and you kind of point it at the world, and you get something out. And you can then work with that. There's no box that you know I put in front of you guys and then we get a game out about listening to a lecture or something like that. So in that respect, there's a kind of fundamentally different uh, 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 authorship mode, creative mode. And I think that's also one of the challenges that speaks to this resistance. You have to work in such a totally different way to make software than you do um, to make stories, whether the stories are written um, or broadcast. Uh, it, it represents a real paradigm shift. I'm going to go over here. And this is our dean, Ernie Wilson. Hi. Uh, so, sorry Thank very much for hosting me. Mm -hmm. Sorry to miss the first part of the talk. I have two questions for you. One is that it seems that your work um, intersects with a whole bunch of different communities of practice and thought that don't always talk to each other. And so I guess one question would be, who's been most enthusiastic about your work? You talked about those who were sort of skeptical. 
but who's been the most enthusiastic? And then secondly, if you were going to design the perfect team to design this from conception to um, collecting the checks at the end of the year when it hits, what would that team look like? Okay. Small questions. <laughs> the, in, in many ways, I feel that, that the enthusiasm about work like mine, and, and, and this work on journalism is sort of the latest in a long installment of trying to think about the way that games can be about things in the world, in a broader sense. Um, it, that enthusiasm has largely been rhetorical. And, and what I mean by that is, is that it's, it's great to stand up in front of people and take this thing, video games that they think are prurient and you know, just for pleasure, and you throw away, you waste your time doing, and say, no, there's the possibility that it could be used for good. Um, that's great. Um, but then it never gets further than that. That, that level of, uh, of depth is sort of all as far as we go. So, you know, I, I've been doing these, these radio interviews and stuff um, uh, after the last few games. Uh, and they all ask the same question, you know, to start it off. You know, aren't games just for fun? How can you use them for journalism? You know, and, 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 you know well, yeah. Right. right. <laughs> and, and, and interestingly, the, uh, the game development community also not terribly enthusiastic about this sort of thing, uh, partly because the dynamics of well, the game industry is stuck somewhere between Silicon Valley and Hollywood. They don't kind of really know what they want and what they want to say and if they have anything to say. Um, so in that respect, the most enthusiastic community for, for work like this um, is like, uh, you know, PR and advertising. You can take with that and, and you know, do what you will. But th those are the ones who are running with this stuff, for better or worse, and largely it's for worse. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that this is hard to do. It's hard to take um, the complexity of the world and even convince yourself and others that the best way to take that complexity is to render it in a medium that's capable of depicting complexity rather than simplifying it and condensing it down into a few inches of space in the paper or a one-liner that you can you know, put at the bottom of your television screen or tweet out to the world on the internet. Uh, so I think my answer to the first part of your question is that I'm, I'm not sure there is enthusiasm. Actually, I think this is I mean, somewhere between what Bogdan is doing. There is a community of people who are developing education here. There are. And I would have thought that they would see this as not shoot the yeah, but right. The educational game market has an interesting and complex history. Uh, it was better in the 1980s than it is today, um, and then it got a little full of itself and sort of collapsed in, in, in the 90s. Uh, there was this sort of math blaster uh, period in which what ed an educational meant was kind of like a skill and drill game. Um, you know, everyone points to games like Oregon Trail as sort of the uh, the heyday of the educational game, and it's kind of true. There's almost not better games to, to point to educationally. The problem with the educational market is the schools because. That the, you have to sell into school systems in order to have a viable business as an educational game maker. Because if you're trying to sell your game as competing with entertainment games, then you lose. But selling into the school systems right now is a real nightmare because then we had this no child left behind thing that happened. Nobody wanted to invest in anything except what would make the test results look good. Mm -hmm. So you're you're right that, that there is this there's this opportunity, but again, the, the kind of politics of, of reality make it harder to take advantage of. Um, but your second question, how do you get this stuff done? Uh, I think it partly depends on the sort of work that you want to do. Uh, like what kind of game is right to make for the right circumstance. One of the things that bothers me about the current state of, uh, of, kind of professional journalism today is that it's too focused on the tools and not focused enough on, on opportunities and, and goals. The, you know, the idea that there is a job somewhere called flash journalist, which is, which is one of the things that we see a lot of now, um, well, it's something that people are regretting this year compared to last year, because it turns out that this year we're not sure if flash of technology is going to persist into next year. So like that, that's a great lesson in why you don't want to put a tool at the forefront of your, um, of your work. You know, I think this idea, in, in my ideal world, is this, is this sort of computational journalist. You have somebody who's doing real journalism, but their way of expressing it, their way of rendering it, or, or inscribing it, is through software. Absent that, what you want are um, you want to find some way of introducing this uh, this practice of making games in the newsroom in a way that is that is synthetic and not kind of like an outsourced afterthought. Uh, where you, you, know, you, you can imagine someone taking a story, and I've talked with, I mean, CNN is the worst. You know, CNN's, I'm, in, I'm from Atlanta, and 
CNN's down the block, and I go and I talk to them every six months, and like they've reorged, and you know, there's somebody new in charge, and you know they always say the same thing, which is, oh, we really want to take this, you know, we want to make something, and, and then and then we'll you know we'll really get it done, and we're going to invest in this, uh, and what what they lack is someone inside who's who's advocating for it every day, rather than you know me coming every six months and talking to them about this stuff, and then they get excited about it again. Um, so again, I think what it comes down to is, is having someone in a position of authority saying, well, you know, the, the incentives that I'm going to put in place relate to experimentation. One way of, of, uh, of experimenting uh, with journalism technologies, with video games, go to it, tell me what you can do. Here are some resources, and then those resources ought to be invested in bringing the right people together to work in small groups um, to create things. One of the challenges here, I, I don't want to get too, like, um, this is again, this is one of these kind of Pandora's box issues, but because of that kind of, um, because of the sort of techno-libertarianism of high tech, it's difficult to find uh, technologists who, who deeply care about the world. And it's a simpler way to put it. Uh, and, and we've kind of, we are, we are now laying the bed that we made in that respect. And overcoming that is, you know, how do, how do you do that? That's where this, this idea of like, you know, training computer scientists and journalists together um, starts to arise. And Northwestern has been experimenting with this, but only at the graduate level on an experimental basis. Columbia is now like claiming that they're going to try to do. I don't really know how that's going to work. I think you need to get to them earlier. Uh, we've got this degree, this bachelor's degree at Georgia Tech called Computational Media, in which we you know we get them in at 17 or 18, and we we try to we try to have we try to make them see culture and computing from the get go and work in both of them. And, and you know we're thinking about what it would mean to add sort of civic media to that mix. Uh, but none of this stuff is going to is going to cash out for many years. Uh, this is a real, like, fundamentally hard problem that won't have a simple answer. Uh, I just want to say that you know I, I think one of the parts I did really enjoy about the book was the the, the sense of providing for journalists this idea of the platform and the way that that they're being utilized that can be applicable to right. how journalism is done. You know, and as somebody who spent literally three years on an investigative documentary film, it's really hard too. Yes. Everything's it's hard, really right? hard. Yeah. And so the idea that this is less hard or more hard, you right. just have to take that off right. the table right away. Right. And say, yeah, it's hard, but you know, it's really exciting and interesting and challenging and it can, and to really encourage yeah. people to go out and do it. Yeah. And so to your question, I think it's hard, but if you're interested, you should go for it. Yeah, I mean, like, and there are a lot of people on this campus in, in particular, between gaming and the gaming department and journalism who could support that kind of endeavor. And that's a really good place to do it. So that's, that's my... Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Sorry, really. this is more into being a common question. Sorry. <laughs> yes. I, I, I do think that's it is really interesting. Larry. Is there any, <clears throat> I mean, you know, anything known, research studies on the effect, impact, the consequences of playing these games? Do we know whether people learn things they wouldn't have learned otherwise, go on to do things they wouldn't have done otherwise? Do we know anything about the impact? Just ask the gentleman to your left. I, I know. Yes. Uh, there, there, there are some. Uh, my, my favorite, my favorite approach to this, to this, this problem. We can ask the same question, by the way, of, of written, written work. I can oh, and should. Uh, my, my favorite approach to this question is when you, when you encounter a media forum that's about something, um, are you able to have more sophisticated conversations about it afterward? Uh, David Schaefer, who is an educational um, uh, scientist at Wisconsin, has my favorite approach. Which is literally like taking me. He's been focusing on kids largely, but you, you know, you bring people together and you have them talk about something. Um, you know, peak oil or whatever. The local. He did this study with like local waste management, uh, and they have these 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 incredibly skin deep ideas. You know, which are kind of intuitive, uh, uh, commonsensical notions of what's going on. And then, uh, and then you introduce he introduces some game, and his games um, are, are are less digital and more kind of hands on. Uh, in which you, you, you kind of problematize that, that, that topic and say, well, here's kind of the mess of this system. Here's, you know, here's, here's energy. Uh, and then you talk again afterwards. And, and what you really want to see, I think, is not that, that, they're, 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 that they think there are answers, but that, um, that people are weighing consequences and, uh, uh, and trade-offs. We desperately want answers, um, and we, we, we probably never ought to get them because things are just complicated. When we make a choice, by definition, we're making a choice because there is no answer that's good. So that, that's that's my favorite approach. Is there are others, and there are people who try to do this, like you know, you know, like 
neuroscience sort of stuff, and I think that's you know not the right path forward. Um, but I think I think if you look at the discourse that um, that players have about games, and it doesn't have to be about news games or even about you know games that are deal with meaningful topics, just any kind of entertainment game, this like incredibly deep knowledge of the system that's being depicted um, in the game, and they're able to you know, negotiate between two player communities and think about the uh, the way that the, the, the implications of certain kinds of choices within and all, I mean, that stuff is there, and it's being studied, um, but it hasn't yet been, uh, it, I don't think it's motivated investment in this in this area necessarily. Uh, which is interesting because you know when I talk to, um, well, I, I do some work as I, as I mentioned briefly in, in corporate learning, you know, which is another area where I get asked this the same question, and they're really not willing to move forward uh, until they see, you know, kind of evidence part of because they, they don't have any budgets anyway anymore and need some leg to stand on to, uh, to justify doing it. Um, but there is a kind of intuitive eagerness that I've seen to try this out and, and then do some some experimentation with it later. The one thing we do have some data on relates to that whole crossword puzzle stuff. But I find like amazing and fascinating. I totally owe that, that entire chapter to uh, to Ray, who, who suggested that we look at we look at puzzles. Uh, there is um, there is some evidence that um, some large percentage of, of newspaper readers read the newspaper because they they, they do the crossword. Um, and you can look at those kind of patterns and ask, well, you know, what what are the kinds of investments that would uh, that would get that would get folks who are really looking for a particular kind of ritual experience with a game back into the news material that they happen to <coughs> procure as an accident of, of doing it. Now, these are somewhat anecdotal, and, and I want to dig into that further. That's an area that I have some interest in, in seeing some more, more you know, quantitative um, uh, research done in. But other than that, I'm, I'm a fan of this kind of qualitative discourse analysis sort of stuff. Must anyone underestimate the degree to which people often read the newspaper for the crossword puzzle. Anyone who's ever redesigned a newspaper yeah. knows that if you do anything, lessen the type, put the thing yeah. on the fold somehow, you know, that you hear from yeah. resilience of yeah. people. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's the same thing. And this is one of the arguments we made with this, uh, this, this uh, tonight, we used to do this, this authoring system. The, the cartoon uh, has a similar kind of quality. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little welcome now, a little, yeah. a little way in. And when you take that away, because you look at it and you say, well, it's not journalism. Like, we, we cut that. Obviously, we cut the cartoonist. Um, it's a misstep. Who else? Other yes. Are you talking a uh, question on kind of the philosophy of the news, which I feel like you have an interesting outsider's perspective on, and how innovation, the kind of innovation you're talking about with games, requires failure. It requires not just occasional failure, but regular failure. And I think that we uh, can see it in uh, when we're developing new technologies, how that might be worth it. And there's a culture of failure around Silicon Valley in certain ways. There's also a culture of failure around some of the news as business that's going on, where we can see why there might be some incentives to experiment with business models. <coughs> but if what you're talking about is, is that games are difficult and are going to fail in an ongoing way, we, need, um, we might need editorial failure as well. And, and so I'm wondering yeah. if you've encountered opportunities where you feel like failure at the editorial level is acceptable or even encouraged uh, for any any parts of the news industry. It seems like that's the kind of alignment that might be needed right, yeah. to have, have an ongoing games industry. Yeah, in, well, in my experience, which is just my experience, has been that there's uh, almost no risk tolerance from an editorial perspective. I don't know if that's what the rest of you feel, but that's, that's what I feel. Yeah. You cannot ever do anything wrong or even take the chance that you might do something wrong editorially. That's been my experience. I was just talking to a large news organization last week who, um, you know, they're really tiptoeing around this stuff, super excited about it. They see the opportunity, but they want to make sure that they don't even consider thinking about thinking about something that could go the wrong way. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, that's my experience. Uh, I hope it's not, I, I hope it's not everyone. A games construction question. It seems to me that one of the things that you would want would be a game that keeps, that keeps going. Mm -hmm. Now, if you construct a game based on something that's already happened, I can see how you would. And if you are presumably in the journalism context, 
adhering to facts as best as you can. How can you construct an open, I mean, I suppose you can if the constructor's construction crew keeps running alongside the game and, you know, laying the track ahead of the, uh, yeah. of the players. I mean, have you thought about sort of keeping it yeah. going? I mean, yeah. Dick Cheney's shooting someone, you know, we know. Right, yeah, that's it, it's over. Yeah. yeah. Um, How do you have one that unfolds? Well, this, that, that sort of falls into this kind of platforms domain for me. So that, that democracy game that I showed it, very strange screenshot, it was kind of an example of what you're talking about. Really, it's a, it's a little platform world in which a society operates. And you can go in and add stuff to it and take stuff away without, um, without muddling with the game itself. Uh, but that's a simulation. That's true. It's a different. It's a different kind of game. I mean, has anyone tried to do an unfolding, like say, let's say the, you know, the 2012, you know, the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. So you start out with the players, you know, and you sort of keep going, feeding events in as they happen, but also <laughs> allowing people to. Yeah, <laughs> right. I've talked to some organizations about this, and particularly about cyclical news that, that, that is predictable. You know, there's going to be an election. There's going to be a hurricane. Um, and I've seen some interest in that. I, I think the, here's the rub, right? Games are bad at story. We shouldn't make games tell stories. They're not good at it. Tell stories through, you know, media that, that are good for storytelling. Games are great for systems. And systems don't necessarily correspond well with the, uh, the carrying out of events. So if you wanted to make a game about, about the political system, and there are games about, um, of, you know, you were, you're, you're kind of a campaign manager and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's not so much about what we're going to have the primaries, or we're going to have all this gossip before the primaries, but who the candidates are going to be, and then the candidates are going to announce their uh, their candidacy, and then we're going to have primary, and so forth. But rather, well, you know, there's this kind of this whole like system of, of the electorate and how it operates, uh, and that's the subject. Uh, and you know, that's changed over time, or it's you know, it's it's, it's being altered as people respond to it in different ways through through media and technology and so forth. But it's not really well served by um, by talking about the, the steps along the way. I think that's tough to wrap your head around if what, if this, if what you're used to doing is telling stories about things that happen. So we're, we're a, a very simple way to put it is that games seem to be good at that how question. So that would be like the redistricting game. Like the redistricting game. What about like fantasy football? Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 What about yeah. player loops, like player feedback loops for something like I don't know if these when Jane would actually like listen to the comments we, and then make stuff. There, there's lots of stuff we can right. do, right? I mean, I mean the general, general statements. Uh, the the um, the idea of taking what people do and altering, you know, uh, and responding or altering or adding things to it. I think that's still a bit different from, you know, well, you know, first there was the event, and then there was the arrest, and then there was the trial, and then, you know, and then and then there was the sentencing. And I don't know that I'm interested in hearing. I mean, forget about games. I just don't know that I want to hear that. Anymore. What I want to know is, like, okay, well, what are the what are the sort of you know cultural or, or, or civic dynamics that are producing that particular event in the first place? Show me what's underneath. That's what I want to see. Uh, I think that's what we best want people to see, rather than uh, the personalities and, and kind of the, the, the easy stuff. You know. The last question goes to the last row, and then remember, outside we have for sale. For Well, I mean, part of part of I, I have I don't have to just plant the seed. I have to get some of these or these organizations to try it out. Otherwise, the Knight Foundation comes after me. So the the thing that we're making we're, we're is like really weird and wacky and high concept because what we're what we're really trying to produce is a, is a tool where you you as a as a user anybody should be able to use this can drop in and sort of say, well, here are some relationships in this topic that I'm working with and. And you know, here's what this character or this or this object is supposed to look like. And then there's um, there's this AI generation system that kind of spits out a candidate game. It's a really dead simple little game because it's only trying to get you in. And then you kind of look at it and go, huh? Well, that's not exactly what I had in mind. Uh, let me make this adjustment, and it'll spit out another game. And in our prototypes, you can you can do this in five minutes. Not you can get a little a little game. Um, so one of the reasons that, that we wanted to pursue this was precisely because it's very low impact for real news organizations to try, even if they don't publish anything, just to, to kind of try. And as we're developing, we have two years, well, we're, we're four months, we're two years. Um, we are 
are going to try to do that early in order that we can understand the relationship between the um, the operation of the various the various newsrooms, and we're looking at different kinds of organizations that work in very different ways, uh, and what how they would want it to work uh, in order for it to be something that might be that might be adopted. In some way. So you're actually looking for newsrooms. Yeah, I'm desperately looking desperately for partners looking to do this. So if you know people who want to try something out for free, and, you know, it only takes a little bit of their time. Uh, please let me know. Well, that's a good way to finish. Join me and thank you. <laughs>